In this episode, we're going to explore two great cities, Belfast, located in Northern Ireland, and Glasgow, located in Scotland. And I totally have Belfast Child by Simple Minds playing in my head right now. In case you didn't know, Simple Minds is from Glasgow. I'm having a coffee at Belfast Castle. The castle has amazing, spectacular panoramic views of the city. It sits high up on a mountain. There's a fantastic restaurant inside where you can get coffee as well as foods. And outside there are amazing grounds. Uh, it's almost like a park here. So come enjoy. Belfast Castle is set on the slopes of Cave Hill Country Park, 400 feet above sea level. Its location provides unobstructed views of the city of Belfast. The original Belfast Castle, built in the late 12th century by the Normans, was located in the city center. The original Belfast Castle burned down. The current one that stands was built somewhere between 1811 and 1870. But as you can see, you can walk upstairs, but it's mostly like banquet and meeting space these days. So it's not what you would expect in when you go inside a castle. When Harry Potter is in Belfast, this is where he keeps his cloak. In addition to the restaurant, the castle boasts an antique shop and visitor center and it is a popular venue for conferences, private dining, and wedding receptions. Behind me is the Titanic Belfast. It opened in 2012 and is basically an exhibition with a self-guided tour that covers everything from the Titanic being built all the way to its sinking, as well as the explorers finding it and documenting that. Um, it's a really nice thing to go see. Uh, there's a lot to do inside. Uh, there's even a restaurant inside. And what's interesting is it's actually here at the shipyard where the Titanic was actually built. Titanic Belfast opened in 2012 as a monument to Belfast's maritime heritage on the site of the former Harland and Wolf shipyard in the city's Titanic Quarter where the RMS Titanic was built. It tells the stories of the ill-fated Titanic which hit an iceberg and sank during her maiden voyage in 1912 and her sister ships RMS Olympic and HMHS Britannic. Titanic Belfast's exhibition consists of nine interactive galleries covering themes such as the boomtown of Belfast, the shipyard, the maiden voyage, the sinking, and the aftermath, just to name a few. I found the exhibit Titanic Beneath to be one of the more fascinating as it talks about the wreck and its rediscovery. Your ticket to Titanic Belfast also includes entrance to the SS Nomadic. The SS Nomadic was also built by the same ship company, the White Star Line. This is the only surviving ship built by them. This one was built in 1911 and is significantly smaller than the Titanic. It was known as the little sister to the Titanic. The SS Nomadic was built to transfer passengers and mail to and from RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic. It is 220 feet or 67 meters long, weighing in at 1,273 tons with five decks and capable of holding 1,000 passengers and a crew of 14. She has been painstakingly restored with hull repairs and painted in her original White Star Line livery.
So I'm driving through Northern Ireland and I have a rental car from Six Rental Car. And, you know, of course, over here they drive on the wrong side of the road, where in the United States we drive on the right side of the road. I have a manual transmission and it takes about five minutes to get used to driving, to shifting with your left hand. If you don't know how to use a manual transmission, then just get an automatic. It's, but all the same rules apply. Uh, everything's just reversed. Uh, you know, you're basically, uh, all, the, all your traffic is on this side now. You know, you're passing cars this way. So it's pretty easy to do. There's nothing better than sharing a beer with friends. Except maybe sharing a brewery with friends. And the Boundary Brewery is doing exactly that. Sure, telling your friends that you're hanging out at a co-op craft brewery in Belfast might get you branded as a hipster by some. But the excellent beer and laid back atmosphere of Boundary makes it worth swallowing that dubious distinction. The co-op model of the brewery means that the people there are really invested in what they do. And it's not just the members who are enjoying Boundary's offerings. They've received the distinction of Best Beer in Northern Ireland from some online publications, as well as Best Brewer and Best New Brewery. And the boundary of Boundary continues to grow. Their distribution has extended as far as London. So we started three years ago. Um, our two co-founders are Matthew Dick, who is our head brewer, and Matthew Scrimgar. Um, Matt Dick went to the States, discovered a whole new world of good beer, came back here and kind of knew that he wanted to open a brewery. So he was introduced to Matt Scrimgar, he introduced him to the cooperative model and um, right. meant as a business, what it meant for him, what it meant for members, and what it meant to the people who would be buying the beers. Right. Um, but yeah, we we like big, kind of punchy American IPAs, uh, Belgian style beers, saisons, stubbles, quads, all that kind of thing. And um, we've made about 170 different beers. Wow. Oh. So you guys beers. keep them rotating pretty frequently. Yeah. yeah. So we have we have four core beers that we make all year round, nice. and then the rest we kind of change. Nice. Uh, I don't think I've ever been in a brewery that feels as much like an art studio as I have here. Yeah. Our, so. our labels are individually commissioned paintings from an artist called John Robinson. Uh, John and Matthew had known each other for a couple of years. A story got out last year that I was having at a restaurant in Belfast that uh, John was blind and we brought him in, plied him with beer and he painted the canvas. Uh, we actually brewed a beer a couple of months ago called Blind Artist to kind of celebrate that urban myth. Um, but John's not blind and we don't kidnap. Right. Well, well. <laughs> this portion of our trip finds us in Glasgow, Scotland. Here we're going to take a look at a cathedral, the necropolis, which is an old cemetery that is just way cool. And we're going to check out some food, of course, and we're also going to check out some art. This is the Necropolis in Glasgow, Scotland. Necropolis means city of the dead. This is a massive cemetery with over 3,500 graves and was founded in 1832. While I said 3,500 graves, there are actually 3,500 monuments, but more than 50,000 individuals have been buried here. The Glasgow Necropolis is a Victorian cemetery on a low but very prominent hill to the east of Glasgow Cathedral. People treat the Necropolis almost like a park. It's got greenways that people are walking on, people are sitting in the grass just enjoying the outdoors and the views are astounding. You can see the uh, Glasgow Cathedral as well as just all of Glasgow. The 
The land the necropolis sits on has an interesting history. It originally was planted with fir trees and was known as Fir Park back in the mid to late 1600s, but in 1804 those trees started to die and were replaced with elm and willow trees and became a Victorian park and arboretum. In 1831, a competition for converting Fir Park into a cemetery with five prizes ranging from 10 to 50 pounds was advertised in the newspapers and 16 plans were received and put on exhibition. David Bryce of Edinburgh won first prize and his brother John Bryce of Glasgow won second. The first burial took place in 1832 and was that of Joseph Levi, a jeweler. The necropolis was one of the few cemeteries to keep records of the dead, including profession, ages, sex, and cause of death. The park-like atmosphere gives life to this cemetery. I've just finished a bowl of lentil soup and some bruschetta at the Duchess on Duke Street in Glasgow, Scotland. And it was pretty delicious. The food's reasonably priced. It's a pretty good place. Okay, I'm a foodie, but preferably a seafoodie. And I just finished the scallops and some onion rings at the butcher shop. Their menu uh, has several seafood items on it, of and of course beef items as well. But uh, there was a lot to choose from, but the scallops were fabulous. So I'm here at Empire Coffee, which is right next to Glasgow Cathedral with my friend Rocco. How you doing, Rocco? I'm not too bad, not too bad, good day. So tell us about your coffee stand. Uh, this is um, basically 1929, uh, old police Mackenzie Trench box, um, used in Doctor Who, you know, in the same style, same idea. Coffee, Colombian coffee, in the middle of an historical part of Glasgow. There's not many of these left. How many did you say was left? 16? 16, 16 in UK, roughly. Okay. Glasgow has six, you know, but Edinburgh has a different style, so they're double the size. So they're not called Mackenzie Trench Police Box. They call something else, different. There's only 16 left, so they're unique. And the original color was red? The original color is red. This, this is the color you would get, you know, from here. And restoring, you know, repainting, I noticed it was red. It was, it was painted by the same people Glasgow Post Office red, so they painted red, so they didn't change the color. In 1980s, 70s, 80s, the police changed to blue. So if you're going to Glasgow Cathedral or the Necropolis, this is a must stop. His prices are better than a coffee shop. His coffee is better than a coffee shop. And the place is pretty cool. And he'll even go as far as telling you some of the areas to go see. So it's a must see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Clyde River is Scotland's second longest, and for centuries it's been a hub of the shipbuilding industry. And here at the Clydeside Distillery, they're making something almost equally as important to sailors. Glasgow has a rich history of whiskey distilling. In the early 60s, they had over 40 whiskey companies in the city and could have made a strong claim to being the kings of scotch in the country. Unfortunately, by the 21st century, the whiskey presence in Glasgow had dwindled significantly. But Clydeside aims to reverse that tide and help return Glasgow to its former golden glory. Located in an old pump house at the Clydeside Dock, their beautifully restored building pays perfect tribute to whiskey's past and future. Their tour comes in three parts. First, you start with a self-guided stroll through whiskey's history which is brought to life through fascinating stories as well as projected video and animation. Then a guide leads you through the distillery itself, giving you an expert's take on the process and making sure you don't mess anything up. In our case, they're smart enough to know that we shouldn't be left to wander around a functioning distillery unattended. 
The tour comes to a close in their beautiful tasting room. And although the distillery's own single malt isn't quite yet ready for purchase as it's still in the aging process, they offer a selection of drams from all over Scotland. Their gift shop is kind of a temple to all things scotch, so if you're a connoisseur of the beverage, it's worth a trip in and of itself. They even let you create personalized bottles to share as gifts or to take home as a personal souvenir. I'm here at the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum, and inside you'll find art, culture, and history. The Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum is a museum and art gallery in Glasgow. It is one of Scotland's most popular visitor attractions. It is located near the main campus of the University of Glasgow. The museum's collections came mainly from the McClellan Galleries and from the old Kelvin Grove House Museum in Kelvin Grove Park. has one of the finest collections of arms and armor in the world, and a vast natural history collection. The art collection includes many outstanding European artworks, including works by the old masters such as Rembrandt, French Impressionists such as Monet, Renoir, Pissarro, Van Gogh, and Cassatt. House's Christ of St. John of the Cross by Salvador Dali. The copyright of this painting was bought by the curator at the time after a meeting with Dali. Behind me is the Glasgow Cathedral. Anybody who knows me knows I love old buildings and architecture, and this was built in 1136. Yes, that makes it almost 900 years old. Glasgow Cathedral is today a gathering of the Church of Scotland in Glasgow. Their own website calls themselves a medieval cathedral with an active Christian congregation in the Church of Scotland. And medieval it is. Glasgow Cathedral is also called the High Kirk of Glasgow, or St. Kentigern's Cathedral, or even St. Mungo's Cathedral. St. Kentigern, also known as St. Mungo, was an apostle of the Scottish Kingdom of Strathclyde in the late 6th century, and the founder and patron saint of the city of Glasgow. Yes, he founded the city of Glasgow.
technically, the building is no longer a cathedral since it has not been the seat of a bishop since 1690. However, like many other pre-Reformation cathedrals in Scotland, it is still a place of active Christian worship, hosting a Church of Scotland congregation. Our trip to Belfast and Glasgow has been amazing. There's so much more to see than what we've shown you. Now turn on Spotify and go listen to Belfast Child by Simple Minds. We'll see you the next time. Thank you.